Oh, for the love of God, I was supposed to get robbed tomorrow! <gasps> Well, my evening opened up. What am I gonna do now? I can't go, hey all, Scott here. I don't own Lasagna World Tour. False alarm. I lost everything. Well, except what the robber decided to leave. I wonder why. This is too convenient. You know what I really need to do is buy a $500 console alongside a two grand TV set by a $60 controller to play this free game for $60. Oh, f***ing brilliant! Air. Take it, you son of a bitch. I'm not one to make bad decisions. I'm one to buy a ninth Wii U. So the idea of a person paying full price for a game you can get for a dollar or free. I don't even think God planned that one out. Listen, gaming is bigger than it's ever been before. And I think a key part of that massive growth is mobile gaming. Playing games on your smartphone. It counts. I mean, based on how much playtime occurs, I think my mom is a bigger gamer than I am based on Scrabble alone, yet I'm the loser. I feel like core home console gaming and mobile gaming, however, are a bit too different. There's different design philosophies at play, and mobile games are all created to be played via just a touch screen. So while I appreciate that mobile gaming has broadened the video game landscape and do enjoy a few smartphone titles here and there, I think home consoles and mobile work best when separated. Trailblazer. Every so often, game companies figure that because mobile games do so well, that must mean they should only make mobile games from there on out, or incorporate elements of them into their console games, or say AAA gaming is dying. All because grandpa bought the bird app for a dollar. Oh my god, the console game industry keeps flip-flopping between accepting what it is and trying to embrace mobile. And don't get me wrong, sometimes it works out, but most of the time it's like, hey, we're gonna put this game on mobile just because mobile is huge, even though it would do 10 times better on console because that's where the target demographic is. I'm not mad about it, I'm just really f***ing angry. But what about the inverse of that? What about taking a popular mobile game and putting it on a console? Whoever thought of that should get a Nobel Prize! In hell! Listen, I have a soft spot in my heart for... I don't know what else to call it. The golden age of mobile games. That period of time when the iPhone first opened its app store, come on, everybody remembers those commercials saying how there's an app for everything. When you get an Apple device with the app store available on it, man, I'd just scroll through that thing for hours, finding all kinds of fun free apps, or I'd scrounge up enough money to spend a dollar on one. Oh, the quality was horrendous for many of these apps, but it was a fun era. There was this feeling that smartphone apps could do anything. I downloaded apps that said they were universal TV remotes without any knowledge on how they'd work. They never did. Then there were the one-time gimmick apps like, ooh, a lighter. Nowadays, apps all kind of feel the same and games are mostly free, which is cool, but they're all littered with ads. You can't do anything without a 30 second unskippable commercial blocking your way. And many of the most popular games, they all blend in. Back in 2009 or so, the most popular iPhone games were more unique. They were experiences designed specifically for the phone, and I feel like that contributed heavily to their popularity. Angry Birds was the biggest phenomenon, though it was never a favorite of mine. It was fun, addictive, and worked perfectly with a touchscreen-only device. Stretch a bird, political violence. The game originally cost 99 cents on the iPhone, $1.99 on the iPad, and there were a few releases in the series. You had the original vanilla Angry Birds, Angry Birds Seasons, which gave you constant updates at new levels based on holidays and the time of year, and Angry Birds Rio. You know, they made a movie based on this game. I never considered this to be a trilogy, more so just variations of the original Angry Birds, but it doesn't matter because Activision did. Angry Birds Trilogy. For only $40, you can waste 37. Yeah, physical releases of the first three games for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Nintendo 3DS. Strangely, Wii, Wii U, and PlayStation Vita versions came a year later considering these were platforms that honestly worked better for Angry Birds with touchscreens and pointer controls. The main selling point of Angry Birds Trilogy is to play it on a TV. Was it worth it? No. Don't get me wrong, I see value in playing this game on the TV. You know, pass the controller around, try to beat each other's high scores, but it's just so clunky here. What used to be a game with the simplest control method imaginable now uses literally every face button on the controller. That is impressive. I'd say the Wii and Wii U versions make the most sense. This release is nice as it does preserve three of the biggest mobile games ever, some of which have been delisted and discontinued from the app stores. Yeah, I'll give this release that. It keeps the Angry Birds Rio dream alive. But no matter what, I can't look past the fact that while this is a collection of games, it's a collection of games that retail for $3 total, $6 max buying the iPad versions. In fact, Trilogy was missing some levels from the original game. Some exclusive bonus levels are included, but 
Th th does that really matter with Angry Birds? It's not like these levels are vastly different enough to make you think, wow, new level designs? You don't really care about the design itself. The fun of new levels in Angry Birds is the idea you have a new box to check off. Ooh, a new stage to be and get three stars in? Do you really have a favorite stage in the game? Can you tell the difference between ears of corn? Because if you give me a bonus ear of corn, I'm not gonna be like, oh my God, a new corn? No, it's just, okay, it's just another ear of corn for me to eat. The bonus stages in Angry Birds Trilogy. It's a fine release. I mean, the Angry Birds series are solid games. It would have been cool to get games made specifically for consoles rather than just the mobile games all over again. And the initial price point of $40, no matter who you were, was hard to swallow. So Activision listened and they knew a trilogy of games wasn't enough for that price point. They charged more for one. Angry Birds Star Wars for $50, released one year later for pretty much every console at the time. I feel like they wanted to push to be there for the PS4 and Xbox One's launch and they knew they could go consumers into buying into it. But the birds will be pissed. The fact they pretty much sold a single $1 mobile game for $50 when at the very least they could have included Angry Birds Star Wars 2 in the package considering that came out a few months prior to this console release. I'll throw Angry Birds space in there. It's pretty dumb. Like who the hell would buy this? Ignore that question, but disregarding all of that, Angry Birds Star Wars does offer family fun for less than most AAA games. Multiplayer is now included, which adds so much value to the game, even though it's literally just passing the controller to the other player for their turn, which you never needed a multiplayer mode to do that before, but it's a fantastic addition to a solid game. That's how some reviews of this read, and I don't get it. To be fair, I think most saw this as ridiculous, and if it actually sold well, I think we would have seen far more physical Angry Birds releases by now. They were always banking on these games, luring in parents that know nothing but their kid likes Angry Birds and maybe their kid's name. All without realizing you'd spend $90 on both releases when these would all cost you $4 on the App Store. But then again, it's good to know these games will forever be preserved via these physical methods. I'm sleeping well tonight! Alright, enough about the pissy chicken saga, let's talk about the best mobile game. Cut the Rope hit the scene around the same time as Angry Birds, and I always preferred it. A very simple yet engaging puzzle game. Nab all three collectible stars by cutting the ropes, holding the candy to get it to the monster Om Nom's mouth. You know a bunch of nine-year-olds see this game and go, oh my childhood! But no guys, let's give Cut the Rope more credit. I mean, I think this is so much better than Angry Birds. It's so smartly designed, and unlike that game, I remember so many of these levels. The gimmicks they employ, the sound effects, music, the visuals, and animation are phenomenal for a mobile game released in 2010. Hell, even in general, they're fantastic. And the fact this game could not work as well without a touchscreen, it just makes this one of my top mobile games of all time. If this was never a mobile game and was just a DS game published by Nintendo, you would all eat it up. Every one of ya! But you know the old saying, if it's good, make it bad. Got the Rope launched on the Nintendo DSi shop channel in September of 2011. I should know, I bought it back then. I think you could all tell. I don't know, I knew I liked Cut the Rope on my iPod Touch and I wanted it on my DSi at the time, or Nintendo 3DS to be more exact. It is a pixelated, choppy as hell, dumbed down version of Cut the Rope but it still cut the rope. They translated it over to the DS as well as they could, honestly. Going for the horizontal book style, it works well enough, albeit there's no reason to play this if you already had an iPhone or iPod Touch at the time. I think one of the reasons I picked this up was due to the lack of software on 3DS at the time, so I went, yeah, sure, this will lead in my buyer's remorse. But of course, I could tell this was a heavily watered down port. I kind of wondered why didn't they just make Cut the Rope for the 3DS entirely? Well, it's my lucky day eight years ago. In 2013, we got Cut the Rope triple treat, a physical 3DS game. I thought this was an entirely new Cut the Rope game made specifically for the 3DS. Triple Treat is like Angry Birds Trilogy, three Cut the Rope mobile games converted to a video game system, in this case, the 3DS. The back screenshots have these 3D models of Om Nom, and I thought like, okay, that must be a new bonus side game or something. Each game is played on the bottom touchscreen, with the top being a completely superfluous 3D model of Om Nom. When it gets the candy on the bottom screen, it gets it on the top, so it's sort of like the top screen is an extreme close-up, though it's delayed enough to not make for a cool effect. This isn't a bad game by a long shot, it runs much better than the DSi version, plus you get two other other games, a collection of promotional animations, later boards. I really do think Cut the Rope is a good puzzle game, but playing on the 3DS doesn't benefit the experience at all. If anything, it's worse due to the lesser touchscreen. For $30 at launch, again, it's a bit 
much. It's not like you wouldn't get $30 of use out of this thing. I mean, the back of the box boasts over 50 hours of gameplay. Yeah, I got four years out of my $10 box cutter. Does that make it worth 900? Sticking to the 3DS, let's try out Doodle Jump Adventures, also released in 2013 alongside a DS version, Doodle Jump Journey plus Doodle Jump for Connect for Xbox 360. Jesus, that was a big year for this stuff. Did everybody collectively go, let's make worse versions of our mobile games and charge 30 times more? Shit, minds think alike. Doodle Jump is an endurance test. Tilt your device and see how high you can go. There's not much to it. This is one of those games you see all these adaptations and merch of because companies see it as a big phenomenon. When I think it did well because it was a simple game on the App Store during a time when people would download damn near anything if it was free. So of course it got a 3DS game and a Hot Topic t-shirt. Yeah, it's Doodle Jump now taking place across two screens, which honest to God is kind of disorienting. Adventures refers to the campaign, which are literally just Doodle Jump stages with definitive ends and that's it. Well, on to the next one, basically the same thing. Is Doodle Jump Adventures worth it? Let's be fair though, sometimes the transition to consoles can go quite smoothly. Here we have Fruit Ninja Connect. Oh, he's not a ninja, he's a fruit ninja. Oh, bad ass. This is one of the best conversion ideas. Fruit Ninja was all about swiping combos of fruit while avoiding missing any and bombs, but Connect for Xbox 360 gives you the exact game, but you use your body now, karate chopping the fruit away. It's honestly one of the best uses for Connect, and is truly distinctive enough from the mobile release to be completely warranted here. Fruit Ninja for PlayStation Vita. It's literally the exact same thing as the iPhone release at the time, so bravo, it was a flawless conversion. But why do this in the first place? Oh. So, it's the exact same game, downloadable only, no new control options, featured anything, for $8. At least with Angry Birds Trilogy and Star Wars, you had the excuse of them being on home consoles for the first time. Wait, actually, Angry Birds was made available on the PS3 and PSP stores separately as early as 2011. Almost seems like there was a push by Sony to have some popular mobile games on the PS3 because around this time, Jetpack Joyride hit the system. While overpriced and offering nothing new, these versions, I think, feel pretty genuine as downloadable games from this era. The same goes for Flight Control, which released on DSiWare, WiiWare, and PlayStation 3, only in Europe and Japan for some reason. No market for it in the US. In Europe, they won't shut the f up about it. Games like Pac-Man 256 released on PS3, PS4 and Xbox One after the mobile version without any microtransactions or advertisements, with controller support for just one low price, which this game works great in both contexts. As a quick pick up and play mobile game and as a fun content complete downloadable console release. It proves there's genuinely really quality stuff on mobile, stuff that can work just as great on consoles as well. Gameloft is the leading supplier of mobile games. They've always been that, just a degrade Ubisoft clone who pumps out unoriginal, uninspired mobile ripoffs of more popular console games. A lot of their games aren't horrible or anything, but they're just nothing sacks of not. And their premiere series has always been Asphalt, basically your mobile phone alternative to Need for Speed. This is a long running series, but who gives a sh the original Asphalt Urban GT and Urban GT 2 released on Nintendo DS actually before cell phones, so starting with Asphalt 3, it became a completely mobile focused series. The games like Asphalt 4 hit the Nintendo DSi shop and Asphalt 6 the Nintendo 3DS as a launch title. Asphalt 3D. This was one of the first 3DS games I bought mainly because it was the only game I could afford after already picking up Pilot Wings Resort. After reading Oedipus Rex, I said I too should have a tragic ending. I remember not having any opinions on this game and frankly, that's how I feel about this entire series. It's such a soulless car game. There's nothing unique about it. It gets the job done. Like if you have a pheromone release when you see a car move, sure. But Ridge Racer 3D launched right alongside the 3DS too. So it's like, why not go for that one? I'll tell you why, because Asphalt is always cheap or free. That's how they get you. Asphalt 9 was a mobile game converted to the Nintendo Switch and it's more of the same, but this time it's free to play. Again, it's playable, it works, it does the job, but there's something about these games that always makes me feel like I'm wasting my time playing them. And I just beat Ride to Hell Retribution. Now why does Gameloft bring these games to consoles? Well, it's usually if they think they can fill a certain void. Case in point, Modern Combat Blackout on Nintendo Switch. This series is to Call of Duty what Asphalt is to Need for Speed. Who the hell likes this series? They're to put your damn hands down. If you want to Call of Duty like experience on your smartphone, here you go, Call of Duty. Even the title is just a rip off of Modern Warfare. And again, the games, they're fine, but they review surprisingly well. And I think that is entirely due to the fact that they're good for mobile games. But then when they brought it to Nintendo Switch, ha! 
The cracks start to show with games like this in Asphalt when you put them on an actual console, and the only reason they put Modern Combat on the Nintendo Switch was due to the lack of Call of Duty. There was no legitimate game from the series on the platform at the time, and people wanted a first-person shooter experience like that to play. Gameloft saw the opportunity and quickly put a mobile game from 2014 on the system for $20. Take note, Sophocles. It's not great, in fact, it feels pretty pathetic. I wish they'd put more effort into redesigning the menus of these mobile games when converting them to console. It's just so painfully obvious when something was designed for a touchscreen. And even the controls, while functional, I feel like they were designed to mimic regular FPS controls, but compensating for the clunkiness of the touchscreen, but then letting you use a controller for it. It's so hard to explain, I don't even know what I'm talking about! Unfortunately, many developers just poured over mobile games to the Nintendo Switch, and it's always this really underwhelming feeling when it happens. The system was marketed as a home console, and I'll always see it as that, but when a great handful of games are just mobile ports, there's nothing special feeling about that. Being able to play a mobile game on Switch gives me no joy. There's no feeling of, look at what I'm doing, ma. To which he says, Scott, I don't care you're playing Shinsekai Into the Depths on Switch that's been on iPhone for a year. Final Fantasy XV Pocket Edition was a mobile conversion of Final Fantasy XV, and instead of the actual Final Fantasy XV on Nintendo Switch, we got this version, and I'm sad. There's nothing special about any of this, especially if these versions are replacing getting the traditional edition of the game. Then it's more of a slap in the face compared to not getting any version at all. Football Manager Touch, yeah, the stripped down mobile version of Football Manager. Xbox got a version made specifically for it titled Xbox Edition, the Nintendo Switch. They're not even trying to hide it. And then the Pokemon spinoffs. There's a ton that release simultaneously on mobile and Switch, and they either feel out of place on mobile or out of place on Switch. And now to be fair, they normally launch on Switch first, but you can can't fool me, games like Pokemon Quest and Pokemon Cafe Mix were designed for mobile first. Just look at them. It's unfortunate because we used to get so many Pokemon spin-offs of all kinds for the Game Boy Advance, DS, Nintendo 64, GameCube, Wii, and now, while we still get some big boy spin-offs, a lot of Pokemon spin-offs are relegated to being free-to-play mobile games that get a half-assed Switch version to throw us a bone. But in reality, I think this just opens these games up to more criticism. Again, look at the differences between the review scores of Modern Combat on mobile and Modern Combat on Switch. You become a lot more critical when you play a mobile game on a console like this. But that's just a testament to how big mobile has become. It's impossible to ignore and a franchise like Pokemon makes perfect sense for the platform. Mobile franchises have become so big that we end up getting things like Puzzle & Dragon Super Mario Bros. Edition. Yeah, a mobile game turned 3DS game with an official Nintendo license on it all. I have no idea if I like how this game looks or not. Well, something like this is far more understandable becoming a retail game, especially considering it was made from the ground up for the console. Like VR spin-offs or stuff like the Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare series. Plants vs. Zombies wasn't a mobile game first, but it hit the platform way before consoles, and Plants vs. Zombies 2 is only a mobile game, I'll count it. To be honest, most versions of this game work fairly well. The touchscreen of the Nintendo DS, the version for Xbox 360 was very fine-tuned. It feels great here, but the third-person shooter spin-off, well, that does make a bit more sense for the system. But hey, what if mobile games had their own dedicated system? No. Nuh-uh. Fucking Christ, yes. Take me back to 2013, when every company was making micro consoles literally only capable of streaming Netflix, and even then, some of them couldn't do that. These $100 systems were based on mobile operating systems, so they'd have some mobile games retooled to work on a TV, and in their marketing, they basically said, who needs a PS4 when you can play Crossy Road on this $99 back scratcher? Again, it can't even do that. Here's the thing, I think many companies don't understand what makes mobile games successful, and just think, oh, that means everybody loves this, put it everywhere. Listen, man, I play Flappy Dunk on my iPhone all the time, but it's more of a nervous tick than a, oh, I love this game. I just want something to do with my fingers, stimulate my eyes for a brief moment. Does that mean I'm a big fan? No, it just means I have more to work on mentally than I thought. When Flappy Bird was the biggest sensation for no other reason than it was a bitch hard and all the high school students and coworkers were saying, hey, I got four points in Flappy Bird. No, I got 10. The developer removed it from the app store afterwards. And when Amazon got the exclusive sequel, Flappy Bird's family for the Amazon Fire TV, who really really gave a shit. Mobile games are so much less engrossing than normal console releases. I play mobile games very infrequently, but when I do, I'm not super into them. I know they're just for quick distractions, even if they're legitimately well-designed experiences. So banking on popular mobile games to sell well in any context doesn't really work. Just because these games did well on mobile, it doesn't mean they'll elicit the same reactions on consoles. But that also holds true for console games making the jump to mobile as well. 
So how about if they jump back? Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Well, all the PlayStation 2 Grand Theft Autos were remade for mobile devices. Let me tell you, I bought Grand Theft Auto 3 immediately when that released on iPhone in 2011. I mean, that was a dream come true to be able to play a PlayStation 2 game on the go. And it 100% was that, but... It just didn't feel right played on a touch screen. Like an idiot, I proceeded to buy every Grand Theft Auto that released on mobile afterwards and always had the same reaction. But San Andreas has always been my favorite of the series. And shortly after the mobile release, a new version for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 launched, which was the mobile version. What the hell was this? I guess they wanted to do a remaster of San Andreas and just figured the mobile version was good enough. But like I said, when you do a mobile to console conversion, at least change the menus. It's so awesome obvious when menus were designed for mobile. This just doesn't feel right. You converted a game that used the controller to work with the touchscreen, but then converted that version back to work with just the controller. I don't know why, it just feels weird. And on top of that, it's just not a good version. There's so many bugs and glitches and the game crashes constantly. It just doesn't work well. I have no idea why they even made this. It came out after the Xbox One and PS4 for the PS3 and Xbox 360. They only remastered San Andreas and not the other games from that generation, which also got mobile ports, so this gets the same reaction nearly all these other games got from me. Why the f***? Most mobile to console conversions inherently feel lazy, and that's just the stigma with most mobile releases. They're always seen as lesser than console ones, and sometimes they are, but sometimes they aren't. And <laughs> hey, what else was I gonna do at the apartment today? Take a bath? The rumors are true. I was robbed, but if today taught me anything, it's that no matter how bad your day gets, you're doing better than the guy that bought this.